Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this inspiring TED Talks HCI podcast episode, I explore Nigel Marsh's 2010 TED Talk, How to Make Work-Life Balance Work. Welcome back to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this inspiring TED Talks HCI podcast episode, I'll be exploring Nigel Marsh's 2010 TED Talk, How to Make Work-Life Balance Work. Work-life balance, says Nigel Marsh, is too important to be left in the hands of your employer. At TEDx Sydney, Marsh lays out an ideal day balanced between family time, personal time, and productivity, and offers some stirring encouragement to make it happen. Thanks for joining me, and I'll catch you on the flip side of this first clip. What I thought I would do is I would start with a a simple request. Uh, I'd like all of you to, to pause for a moment, you wretched weaklings and take stock of your miserable existence. (laughs) Now, that was the advice that St. Benedict gave his rather startled followers uh, in the 5th century. Uh, It was the advice that I decided to follow myself when I turned 40. Up until that moment, I had been that classic corporate warrior. I was eating too much, I was drinking too much, I was working too hard, and I was neglecting the family. Uh, And I decided that I would try and turn my life around. In particular, I decided I would try to address the thorny issue of work-life balance. So I I stepped back from the workforce and I spent a year at home with my wife and four young children. But all I learned about work-life balance from that year was that I found it quite easy to balance work and life when I didn't have any work. <laughs> Not a very useful skill, uh, especially when the, when the money runs out. Um, so I went back to work, and I've spent the seven years since struggling with, studying, and writing about work-life balance. Uh, and I have four observations I'd like to share with you uh, today. The idea of work-life balance isn't new, In fact, this TED Talk is 11 years old, so even back then it wasn't new. We've been exploring this, researchers have been studying this, practitioners and organizational leaders have been trying to implement elements of work-life balance for the better part of several decades now. And really, some of the key principles have been around for much, much longer than that. So I, I appreciate him starting things off in this video by being a little bit vulnerable and talking about his own situation and being able to acknowledge and admit that his life was out of whack. Uh, His wife and his his young children were being neglected. He was spending too much time at work. And I suspect he was a good employee. I suspect uh, he was valued, and I suspect he felt commitment and responsibility to the organization and that he was was, uh, building a life for his family through the work that he was doing. But at some point, somehow, he had a catalyst to be able to self-reflect and realize this wasn't working for him and his family, um, and, and he had to do something different. So he did something most people don't have the luxury of doing, and that is he, he left his job, he spent a year at home. Again, that's a privileged situation. I acknowledge that most people don't have that opportunity uh, to kind of hit reset on their their career and on their life and 
and just spend a year not working and, and living off of savings. But what he discovered over that time was that there are, there's so much more to life than, than work. And he jokes that it's easily easy to find work-life balance when you don't actually have to work. You can just spend time with your family. Of course, that's wonderful. That's not the world or the reality any of us live in. We all do have to strike a balance. And whether we call it work-life balance or any of the other many terms uh, that people often use for it, I think the principle is, is an important one. And that is that we need to strike balance in our life. Uh, we need to strike balance physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, uh, with our career, with our family, and our relationships. Balance generally is an important principle that I adhere to, that I strive for in my own life. And I found it to bring a lot of peace and happiness and, and fulfillment when I can find myself to be more balanced. There's no prescription to what work-life balance should look like or, or needs to look like for you, but I would encourage you as we really dive into this TED Talk and, and discuss, I encourage you to take some time to self-reflect, see where you're at, see how things are going with your personal life, with your work life. Is that um, balance and the prioritization uh, the way that you really want it? Are you able to spend time outside of work doing the things that are meaningful and valuable to you? If we can critically self-reflect, I think that's a really good starting point. And then together with a partner or friends or other family members, you can start to have a good discussion around what your ideal balance might look like. The first is if society is to make any progress on this issue, we, we need an honest debate. But the trouble is, so many people talk so much rubbish about work-life balance. All the discussions about flexi time, or dress down Fridays, or paternity leave, only serve to mask the core issue, which is that certain job and career choices are fundamentally incompatible with being meaningfully engaged on a day-to-day -day basis with a young family. Now the first step in solving any problem is acknowledging the reality of the situation you're in. And the reality of the society that we're in is there are thousands and thousands of people out there leading lives of quiet, screaming desperation, where they work long, hard hours at jobs they hate to enable them to buy things they don't need to impress people they don't like. <laughs> And it's my contention that going to work on a Friday in jeans and t-shirt isn't really getting to the nub of the issue. <laughs> As with any major social or organizational challenge, we need to get below the surface level and really explore the deep-rooted uh, causes and reasons behind uh, the challenge that we're facing. And with work-life balance, it's no different. He, he lays out a humorous and compelling case for why many of the things that organizations are doing to try to strike that work-life balance or provide it for their employees, why it's not hitting the mark. It's really that surface-level issue. It's, it's playing whack-a-mole. And so, for example, casual Friday, eh, that's great. I, I mean, I, th I think dressing up in a suit and tie in most jobs, most days, probably doesn't make sense in today's day and age. Um, but, you know, if... Uh, a corporate culture of casual Fridays, uh, that's, gr that's great. But is that going to solve the problem of overwork and, and people not being able to strike more balance in their lives? Uh, of course it won't. Uh, that's not even remotely uh, a root cause of, of the dissatisfaction and the, the unhappiness and the soul-crushing kind of feeling that people f have when they're in jobs that they don't like for so much of their day. And his point about many jobs, many careers being fundamentally unsuited for work-life balance is spot on. Now, fortunately, there are many jobs where we can strike that balance, but there are many jobs where you simply have no chance of, of progressing. You have no chance 
of rising up the ranks, of getting promotions, and of really being successful unless you are willing to sacrifice every other aspect of your life and throw yourself completely and wholly into your work. Crazy hours focusing only on work. And while that might be good for the organization, it's certainly not good for you. It's not good for your health. It's not good for your relationships. It's not good, really, for your career if you zoom out and take the long um, perspective on ongoing growth and development in a holistic uh, approach to your life and how that's going to give you the chance to do what you love and have passion and thereby grow and learn in ways that are going to help you have even more fulfillment and more successful career. So we need to fundamentally rethink in organizations the way we structure jobs and what we expect of our employees. What expect from our employees? And where do we cross the line into exploitation? Now, I'm of the opinion that many organizations and many leaders, despite whatever their good intentions might be, are consistently and systematically exploiting their employees. We can do better, and we need to do better. Otherwise, uh, we're, our people are going to pay the cost, certainly. But the organization will as well. The second observation I'd like to make is we need to face the truth that governments and corporations aren't going to solve this issue for us. We should stop looking outside. It's up to us as individuals to take control and responsibility for the type of lives that we want to lead. If you don't design your life, someone else will design it for you, and you may just not like their idea of balance. It's particularly important, this isn't on the World Wide Web, is it? I'm about to get fired. It's particularly important that you never put the quality of your life in the hands of a commercial corporation. Now, I'm not talking here just about the bad companies, the, the abattoirs of the human soul, as I call them. <laughs> I'm talking about all companies, because commercial companies are inherently designed to get as much out of you as they can get away with. It's in their nature, it's in their DNA, it's what they do. Even the good, well-intentioned companies. On the one hand, putting childcare facilities in the workplace is wonderful and enlightened. On the other hand, it's a nightmare that just means you spend more time at the bloody office. We have to be responsible for setting and enforcing the boundaries that we want in our life. Can I get an amen to this point? We absolutely need to take control over our own lives. If we're looking to some outside institution, some outside organization, to be able to have our best uh, interests at heart, uh, we're going to be sorely disappointed because institutions and organizations exist to perpetuate themselves and to secure their own future existence. And while even the best organizations, you know, the, the best organizations are going to try to be ethical and take care of their people and not exploit, but it's just the nature of organizations and institutions to do this. And so they're trying to get the most out of you that they possibly can, and you are dispensable. Now, you, you may be sitting there thinking, but I'm a great leader and I'm valued by my company. Yes, that's great. That's wonderful. And you are valued until you're not or until it's more expedient for them to move on to someone else, or they need a scapegoat to take, to take responsibility for some major gaffe from some leader up the line. Organizations are there for self-preservation, they're, and they're there to be efficient, and they're there to make money, and they're not there to make sure that you're living a balanced life uh, that's fulfilled. Now, should they be? I, I would argue yes. I think they absolutely should be. I think an employer always should be. And I think if they are attuned to that, then they're going to be able to help you tap into your passions. They're going to uh, help you feel meaning and purpose in your work each and every day. And that's going to lead to better outcomes for the organization. It's just not the way organizations function. Uh, there, there are some rare examples, glowing examples, uh, that get past that. But the, the, the older the organization, the larger the organization, the more complex it becomes, you are a cog in the machine. So 
my, my point is not to rail on organizations. My point is to say that if you want something in your life, you have to set up the boundaries for that thing. And if you want work-life balance, you have to make choices and set up boundaries in order to make that happen. Because your organization is not going to do it for you. They're going to ask you to do more and more and more. And the more competent you are and the more capable you are, you're going to get more and more on your plate. And they might even stroke your ego and give you a promotion and give you a raise because you're really great. But ultimately, that just means they're going to dump more and more work on you and take over more and more of your life. I remember years back, I applied for uh, promotion at the university. Uh, I'm a professor, as many of you know. I love being a professor. And I decided I wanted to apply for a dean position. And uh, I, I went through the interview process and I, I got the offer and I was about ready to accept it. Um, and at the time I was thinking, wow, what a great opportunity in my career. I can move forward. I'll, I'll move out of traditional, uh, a traditional professor role and I'll become a dean of a business school and I'll lead a bunch of people and it'll be a really great opportunity. And, and I wasn't wrong. It would have been a great opportunity. But as I thought about my family, then I thought about my wife, who then was trying, after years of being at home, uh, having you know our six children and helping to raise the kids, she wanted to, to start her own career. And so I was thinking about my wife, and I was thinking about the time and the work that she needed to put in to make that happen. I wanted to make sure that her career was a priority. I still had a bunch of young children. I, I still do, but then they were even younger. And the timing just wasn't right. It, it probably would have been an amazing opportunity, but it would have required super long hours, more time and attention and focus, um, and less autonomy and flexibility than what I have now. And it wouldn't have allowed me to do all the other cool side hustle things and the consulting and the podcast and those sorts of things. All these things that I really enjoy, none of that would have happened had I taken that job. And nothing against the institution. Like the, the university was a great university. It would have been a great place to work. My point is jobs and organizations are there to get people into jobs to perform work for them. And they're not necessarily thinking about how do we make sure that that person has every aspect of their life in balance. So just, just remember that and Take ownership over your own life. Set up your own personal boundaries. Be willing to say no. And that's powerful. If you can be willing to say no, then you can start to take back your life. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership, Ordinary Everyday Actions That Produce Extraordinary Results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. The third observation is we have to be careful with the time frame that we choose upon which to judge our balance. Before I went back to work, after my year at home, I, I sat down and I wrote out a detailed, step-by-step -step description 
of the ideal balanced day that I aspired to. And it went like this. Wake up well rested after a good night's sleep. Have sex. <laughs> Walk the dog. Have breakfast with my wife and children. Have sex again. <laughs> Drive the kids to school on the way to the office. Do three hours work. Play sport with a friend at lunchtime. Do another three hours work. Meet some mates in the pub for an early evening drink. Drive home for dinner with my wife and kids. Meditate for half an hour. Have sex. Walk the dog. Have sex again. Go to bed. How often do you think I had that day? Uh, we, we need to be realistic. You can't do it all in one day. We need to elongate the time frame upon which we judge the balance in our life. But we need to elongate it without falling into the trap of the, I'll have a life when I retire. When my kids have left home, when my wife has divorced me, my health is failing, I've got no mates or interests left. <laughs> A day is too short, after I retire is too long. There's got to be a middle way. His ideal day sounds pretty wonderful, doesn't it? Now his, his third point though is a very important one. And that is we need to think about the scale of trying to strike our balance in life and with work. Uh, because everything that he laid out in that one single day, I mean, once every blue moon, you might be able to do all those things in one single day, but consistently each and every day, uh, man, I'm, I'm not sure I know of anyone who, who is able to do that. So if you're looking at each day trying to fit every last little piece of, of your life into it, uh, you, you're going to be disappointed. I mean, again, remember that we're trying to look at balance uh, in all aspects of our lives, our professional lives, our personal lives, our, our relationships. We're trying to look at our, our emotional health, our spiritual health, our physical health, uh, our social health, all of these elements, and we can't always do everything in one day. And sometimes you do need to put in 10, 12, 14 hours at work on a given day because there's a, a looming deadline or there's a crisis you have to re respond to. Like there are times where you have to do that. There are times where you need to just spend time with your family. Someone's sick, uh, someone's in the hospital, uh, or you just need time to spend together uh, to build your relationships. So we can't always divide it just by day to day. But then if we're just waiting until we retire to find some sort of balance in life, uh, that, that kind of time horizon is ridiculous as well. So there's something in between that he's arguing for. Uh, maybe we'll get our ideal day from time to time, but let's think more in clusters of days. Let's think in terms of weeks. Uh, like over the course of this week, what am I going to try to do in all aspects of my life? So that I'm making sure that I'm, I'm, I'm devoting time to my friends, to my family, to my own spiritual and emotional health, to my physical health, uh, progressing my career, continuing to learn every day, so on and so forth. And you can start to build in components across the week. And I, I believe just about anyone can do that on a weekly basis. Again, maybe I'm coming from a place of privilege, and I understand that there are homes and there are, are individuals, some of you, some of whom may be listening to this podcast, and you're just thinking, what the crap? What are you thinking? Uh, maybe you're working multiple jobs just trying to make ends meet for your family. Uh, or maybe you're in kind of in the, the height of, of uh, your career progression, and you're in a responsible role, and you're put in 80-plus hours a week, and, and there's just no way. You just don't see how it can be done. I get it. It's hard. Um, and, and I understand that I am coming from a place of privilege as I'm saying this, as is he in his TED Talk. But I still think there's principles that uh, we can implement and start to strike more balance. And then ultimately, we just have to make decisions for ourselves and for our family about what our priorities are, what's most important to us. And all I'm saying is I would argue that work and career, of course, we need to take care of you know, the physical needs of our family and roof overhead, food and mouth, uh, et cetera. But our career isn't the most important thing in life. And, and we can find meaning and purpose um, often without all of the 
titles and the promotions and even the huge paycheck. Something to consider. A fourth observation. We need to approach balance in a balanced way. A friend came to see me last year, and she doesn't mind me telling this story. A friend came to see me last year and said, Nigel, I've read your book, and I realise that my life is completely out of balance. It's totally dominated by work. I work 10 hours a day, I commute two hours a day. All my relationships have failed. There's nothing in my life apart from my work. So I've decided to get a grip and sort it out. So I've joined a gym. <laughs> Now, I don't mean to mock, but being a fit 10-hour-a-day office rat isn't more balanced, it's more fit. <laughs> Lovely, though physical exercise may be, there are other parts to life. There's the intellectual side, there's the emotional side, there's the spiritual side. And to be balanced, I believe we have to attend to all of those areas, not just do 50 stomach crunches. Now, that can be daunting, because people say, bloody hell, mate, I haven't got time to get fit. You want me to go to church and call my mother? <laughs> and I understand, I, I truly understand how that can be daunting. But an incident that happened a couple of years ago gave me a new perspective. My wife, who is somewhere in the audience uh, today, called me up at the office and said, Nigel, you need to pick our younger son up, Harry, from school. She had to be somewhere else with the other three children for that evening. So I left work an hour early that afternoon and picked Harry up at the school gates. We walked down to the local park, messed around on the swings, played some silly games. I then walked him up the hill to the local cafe and we shared a pizza for tea. Then walked down the hill to our home uh, and I gave him his bath and put him in his Batman pyjamas. I then read him a chapter of Roald Dahl's James and the Giant Peach. I then put him to bed, tucked him in, gave him a kiss on his forehead and said, good night, mate, and walked out of his bedroom. As I was walking out of his bedroom, he said, Dad, I went, yes, mate. He went, Dad, this has been the best day of my life, <laughs> ever. Be balanced in your balance. Uh, again, I've already kind of referred to it in earlier uh, clips, but we're, we're looking at all aspects of our lives. And it's not just work and personal, but break it down and talk about the different components of work and the different components of your personal life. Your relationships matter. They're the most important thing. Uh, your, your spiritual and emotional health, your cognitive health, your, your physical health, your social relationships, your social health. All of these things are very, very important. And he tells the really touching story with his child. And I can relate because I've, I've been there, you know, and you get, you get caught up in the grind of work and you're doing all these busy things every day and it's easy to let those little moments just pass you by and it's easy to want to even set them aside because you have something quote unquote more important to do. In this situation though, he, he you know, his wife calls him up, says, hey, I need you to help. He goes and picks up his child. They go and play at the park, they get some food, they go home, read a story, get ready for bed. It's, it's beautiful, it's simple, and, but it's meaningful. It's, it's, uh, it's what relationships are all about, especially with your children. And I, I've had the exact same experience uh, with, with a child. And, you know, we didn't do anything particularly special, uh, you know, in terms of, like, some great event. We didn't go to Disneyland, we didn't go swimming or to the to uh do any expensive thing you know we we just we just had some good time together and and my child knew that i loved them and cared about them and, and gave them some attention and genuinely cared for them and then they say dad this is the best day ever the best day of my life i mean that that is just so touching and yet it, it, it's, a, it's a, such a great reminder to us of what really matters. The, the big paycheck, the fancy car, the big house, uh, the, the nice clothes, none of that stuff really matters at all. And ultimately, if we can focus on our relationships, especially those very most important relationships, like our children, our, our partner, then uh, we can find more 
consistent meaning and purpose in our life. We can find more fulfillment in our life. And ultimately, as we tr strike, as we strive to strike a balance in our balance to make sure that we're addressing all those different areas and components of our whole self, we can be our true authentic self. And we can be healthy, holistically healthy, not just in one aspect of our life. I hadn't done anything. I hadn't taken him to Disney World or bought him a PlayStation. Now my point is, the small things matter. Being more balanced doesn't mean dramatic upheaval in your life. With the smallest investment in the right places, you can radically transform the quality of your relationships and the quality of your life. Moreover, I think it can transform society. Because if enough people do it, we can change society's definition of success away from the moronically simplistic notion that the person with the most money when he dies wins, to a more thoughtful and balanced definition of what a life well lived looks like. And that, I think, is an idea worth spreading. I hope and I aim to have a life well lived. That's my hope and my goal. And some days I'm better at it than others. Some days I find more balance than others. Some days I'm more healthy in various aspects of my life than others. Some days I'm more committed uh, and, and spend time and give attention to key relationships more than others. Um, you know, I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. We're never going to get it perfectly right. Uh, but, you know, trying to strike a balance, it, that's part of the the wrestle of life and it's a good wrestle it's it's something we want to be engaged in we need to self-reflect and we need to try to live the good life and to his point it doesn't require big grand gestures and big life-changing decisions oftentimes it's the little moments it's the little opportunities it's the consistent disciplined focus each and every day to just do a little bit of each of these things that matter to us whether it's every day, every week, whatever, just make sure you, that you're consistently checking with, in with your friends, having an opportunity to, to connect and reconnect and, and to engage with them, with your spouse, with your uh, children, with coworkers, with, you know, look for meaningful relationships in the workplace. All of this all together will create a more sustainable career for you, a more healthy and a holistically healthy uh, life where you're not going to dread going to work. You're not going to always love it either. Some days are going to be harder than others. Some days you're going to be doing things you don't like to do. But you'll always know that it's just one piece of your life. It's one piece of many. And sometimes there's ebbs and flows and one aspect of your life might be going not so great but you have control over other aspects of your life and, and you can make sure that you're doing what you need to do to stay healthy in those areas. So work-life balance, whether you like the term or not, I know some people really take issue with the term. There's other alternative terms, uh, but whether you like the term or not, the principles that he lays out are essential to the life well-lived, to meaningful relationships, to fulfillment in life. And I do believe that we can make a big difference in our organizations when as leaders we model a good healthy balance we encourage our people to strike a balance in their own lives when we do that and we create that kind of an environment that kind of a culture our businesses will thrive when we do that we can be part of changing the societal notion that creates jobs and careers that are fundamentally opposed, the way they're structured and the expectations involved, they're fundamentally opposed to having healthy balance in your life. We can change that. It's not inevitable. It doesn't have to be that way. We can change it. We can be part of that change. And that's something that I know that I'm going to continue to strive to do. And I hope you'll do the same. Thanks for joining me for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. As always, I hope you'll stay healthy and safe that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every week. And I hope you have a great day.
we are excited about the launch of HCI's new magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free, interactive e-magazine designed to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Check out the first issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.